Good evening. You came back. Are they offering like some sort of uh, incentive or something? A Sunday night? People out? What is up with you guys? What a blessing. Um, Tomorrow night, by the way, if you do come back, I told you this morning in service that I was going to be talking about getting something from nothing. That's tomorrow night. And I'm telling you, that one to me is super powerful. Uh, We're going to let Richard Dawkins and Lawrence Krauss explain to us exactly how you get something from nothing. And if you think we have a problem, you haven't heard their side. And we need to hear their side. Uh, Tuesday, Evangelism 101, 10 Things You Can Learn on Evangelism from an Atheist. That's probably one of the most hurtful talks that I give to me personally, because what you see standing up here is really not me. I am not an outgoing person. I'm an introvert. I'm a guy that hides from people unless gospel is involved, unless there's ministry involved. I'm not really super outgoing. So uh, I saw a video years ago that... really convicted me, and I've taken that and do a message on that. And then Wednesday, we're finishing up with uh, Answering Skeptics, Bill Nye. So we're going to take a Bill Nye talk. Again, everything that I do is let's take something that is being used in the culture, let's take it and break it down, address it, and see how we can give answers to it. Or can we? So uh, that's the way that I do things. So uh, our website, I didn't tell you all about this this morning, it's Sunday mornings, I don't want to be real, like, real pushy or anything like that, so our website is rforh.com, if you ever want to go to our website and kind of keep up with us, real, real easy way is download the app, like I told you, you can do that now, <clears throat> right now if you like, just go to your app store and type in reasons for, F-O-R, hope, look for the blue asterisk, our YouTube channel, same thing, YouTube forward slash reasons for hope, all right? And those are, those are all free tools. Hopefully, they encourage you to engage folks in conversation. Uh, that's, our, that's our goal in life. But this evening is, let me see. Yeah, the younger generation don't like this talk very much. So... Uh, You'll understand why as I get into this. I call this, whose voice are we listening to? Anybody know what I'm alluding to with my little voice symbol? Anybody know? Anybody other than me watch that television show? Come on, be honest. Who else watches The Voice? Anybody? Yeah, not many of you. I like the show for the most part. Uh, I enjoy... I enjoy the fact that uh, it's a singing show for the vast majority of you who have not seen it. It's a singing show, okay? And and I'm not a singer by any stretch of the imagination. As a matter of fact, I don't sing. You know, uh, I'm always afraid, like I got this thing on, I'm always afraid like the sound will go on. If it goes live and you hear me, uh, you're leaving, okay? You're going to think the sound system broke or something because God says make a joyful noise unto the Lord. I can't do that. I make a painful noise unto the Lord. So I can't sing, but I like good singing. And so here's the whole premise of the show. Imagine that you've got four judges. They're well-known. Look, this is not a Christian program, okay? All right? We on the same page? It's not a Christian program, but it's a singing uh, program, and it's a competition. So you've got four judges who are, you know, singers in their own right and different genres and all that sort of a thing. But the way the show starts off is what I what attracted me to it is that the judges will have their back to the stage and then the singer comes out and sings a song and the judges will turn around to try to get them onto their team based solely on their voice. Now I like that because we live in a culture that is so superficial at exterior, you know? And I look at that the way I, I think that it's like, man, I like the fact that God looks at us that way. He doesn't look at this. He looks at the inside. And, and, and so I just kind of like that approach. So uh, imagine a few years ago, here's the four judges that were on the, this show a few years ago. And uh, again, I'm not endorsing them. I'm just saying these were the coaches that were on this show this, uh, this season. We're down to the final eight. I don't know how many they start off with. It's a lot of people, okay? And so as the show progresses, you know, they get voted to stay on by the people that watch the show and so on. And so now we're down to the final eight. By this time, everybody's got a pretty good voice, right? So song choice at this point 
I think the whole competition, quite frankly, but at this point especially, song choice is just as important, if not more important, than voice quality. So think about this. Final eight, they're coming out to sing. This is not a Christian program. Think about this. Gentleman comes out and he sang this song, and my wife and I just kind of looked at each other. Take a listen. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. How I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I will cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I'll lay down. I will cling. Okay, what do you think? Did it take some guts to go on this secular television program, finally, knowing you got to get people to vote you through to the next round, and sing the old rugged cross? What do you think? Did it take some guts? Okay, that was lame. Did it take some guts? All right. Well, this isn't the voice that I'm talking about. I'm talking about a different voice. So let's jump into the scripture here and see if uh, we can not identify some things here. John 10, it says this. At the time of the feast of the dedication took place at Jerusalem, it was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. The Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. May I say to you this evening that I genuinely believe this, but I don't think anybody spoke more plainly than Jesus. I mean... He was pretty plain spoken. Yes, there were times he used allegory, but for the most part, Jesus was plain spoken. And it's like, if you're the Christ, tell us plainly. And by the way, had Jesus already told them? Hello? Yeah, he had. Listen, it goes on. Jesus answered them, I told you. You know, I, I spent 24 and a half years as an air traffic controller. Somebody asked me, how do you speak so quick? And it's like, look, I was an air traffic controller for 24 and a half years. The last eight and a half years of my career, I was at O'Hare. If you don't learn how to speak quickly, you don't last long, okay? And by the way, this is not the way that I was raised. I graduated high school from Lexington, Virginia, redneck. I drove a 68 uh, Jeep Scout camouflage paint job, redneck as redneck gets, country draw the whole works, okay? So God took me on this journey to end up there. It's God that did this stuff to me. I see Chicago attitude coming out here, though. I told you. Now, I'm not saying he's from Chicago. I'm just saying I see some of that attitude. Look, you know, you ask a question to people in Chicago, and they're like, what, are you new or something? I told you. And Jesus like, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. Now, here's the point that I want to make to you on this verse. It's not that we don't hear. The problem that I run into, with me especially, is that I don't like what I hear. And many times, what I don't like what I hear coming from the Lord, how do me, I'm going to personalize this, I'm not going to attack you, I'm going to personalize this, I'm a fellow pilgrim on the journey of life, when I hear these things that God is telling me to do and I don't like it, what do I do? Well, number one, make excuses. I am probably the best excuse maker you will ever find in your life. I am a professional excuse maker. If, I, if there's something you don't like about me, I have a reason why I can do it. And if I don't, I can come up with one very quickly. Another thing, strike out in anger. Really? You know what I'm saying? Have that, has this ever happened to you? You talk to somebody, you genuinely care, and you're saying, look, I'm concerned about you. This action is going to lead to this consequence, and they strike back out. You think you're better than me. You're holier than thou, right? Ever have that happen to you? It's a mechanism. It's a mechanism when you don't like what you hear. Or we do nothing. 
400,000 churches across the nation of America and we're as invisible as we are in the culture right now? Well, I think that's because there's another thing we hide. When you don't like what you hear, those are some of the things that I personally will do. I don't know about you. I mean, you got to watch what goes on. Jesus had answered and told them, watch. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they shall follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. May I, may I, may I make a statement here to you to challenge you. If you are in flux, if you are questioning, if you are doubting, you've made a profession of faith to the Lord Jesus Christ, you were serious, you trusted him, and now you got all these questions, and whoa, what about... No one will snatch them out of my hand. No one includes you. When you're in, you're in. Satan's whispering to try to draw you away. Forget about it. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. You think this is an important point? And then watch this. I and the Father are one. Now, may I ask you, is that plain? Is that plain? What did they ask? Are you the Christ? Tell us plainly. What did he do? He told them plainly. And so the response, therefore, was, thank you, Jesus. Oh, man, we have really been wondering about this, and we really appreciate you shooting us straight, right? Is that the response they got? Come on, man, you all know the Scripture. That's not what happened. What happened? They picked up stones. They're going to kill him. And Jesus says to them, for what good work are you going to kill me? And they're like, oh, no, we're not going to kill you for a good work. We're going to kill you because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Did they understand what he said? Yes, they did. But they didn't like it. It's not that we don't hear. The battle that we have going on in our culture right now between this group and that group and these people that do this and that, This is a spiritual battle that we're in the midst of. They pick up stones to throw at them. Guys, what voice are we listening to? I have uh, been very intrigued as I started doing research for this because I got to tell you, there's a lot of voices that are talking to us. And to me, the only way I know how to deal with something is to identify it, then attack it, okay? And so let's identify some of the voices, and then let's deal with them. Number one voice is internet. Is that a voice that's having an impact on a generation? Hello? Man, I'm going to tell you, this is where I get the younger generation not liking me very much, but I'm going to love you enough to shoot you straight. Adults, parents, and grandparents, please hear my heart. I am going into this not because I'm here to tell you how bad you are. I'm going into this to tell you how bad this area is and how much it's impacting a generation. We have to be aware of it. Then you make decisions with the information that you have. If I'm blowing smoke at you, you go read, do your own research. He's out of here, got nothing. Okay, but go study for yourself and see if what I'm telling you is true. Here's what I have found. How much time are we spending? Well, New York Times says those ages 8 to 18 spend more than seven and a half hours a day on smart devices. Seven and a half hours a day. This is a voice that's having an impact. And by the way, it continues on, and that does not count the hour and a half that you spend texting or the half hour they talk on their cell phones. When you take everything together, multitasking, okay? Because younger generation is much better at multitasking than me, Like me, right now, I'm multitasking. I'm walking and talking at the same time. You know, younger generation is driving, texting, and watching a movie, okay? (laughs) And got music going in the background. So they're, they're, they're much better at multitasking. So how much time is this voice spending in that this younger generation's life? They pack on an average of nearly 11 hours of media content in a seven and a half hour period because of multitasking. Is it having an impact? Let me ask you a question before I go any further. Number two killer, America, the most Christian nation on the planet, quote unquote, number two killer of young ladies, teenage young ladies in America is suicide. Number one cause of suicide is 
Anxiety and depression. Number one cause of anxiety and depression is, stick with me. Dr. Carolyn Leaf wrote this. Teens are exposed to eight and a half hours on average of electronic media per day. According to the archives of general psychiatry, this increased simultaneous exposure to electronic media during the teenage years is associated with an increase in depression and anxiety. Do you, do you hear my heart when I say to you, parent, we have so many children that are on medication today because of, uh, because of some sort of depression, uh, some sort of ADD, so much medication. Go speak at a Christian camp or just go attend a Christian camp and watch when it's time for a meal and they have to hand out medication and you've got a line with over half of the kids that are at the camp having to take some kind of medication. Something's not right. Anxiety and depression... This is the tool. This is the drug that's causing it. And we are paying for it and putting it into our children's hands. Stick with me, please. You may not like me, but go dig for yourself. See if what I'm telling you is wrong. Norway, the Bergen Facebook addiction scale, was developed in response to research showing that addiction to social media is proving to cause the same damage in the brain as addiction to alcohol and cocaine and is as addictive as drugs, alcohol, and chemical substance abuse. We are putting the drug into our children's hands. We are paying for it dearly in more than just financial ways. I can't take it away from them, Carl. They'll get mad at me. What? That's your job. You're the parent. You're supposed to make them mad. I'm joking. But put, think about this for a second. What's going to happen to a cocaine addict if you take cocaine away? Oh, I can't take it away because it's going to make them mad at me. This is a drug. We've been putting it in their hands. It's having an impact, and now we're afraid to do anything about it. You better toughen up. Satan's not playing here. How much is too much? If you want to read an interesting book, research that really, really flipped me, man. I was like, whoa, this is interesting. This lady I do not think is a Christian. Look up this, this book. iGen, just look up I, letter I, G-E-N, like iPad, I this, you know, iMac and all that stuff. And then her last name is Twins, T-W-E-N-G-E. It's a 22-word title, so I won't read the whole thing to you. But his research has been done for years. Imagine taking the exact same survey for years and asking the exact same age group those questions over these many years. Because now you can compare apples with apples, Right? How is a 15 to 19 year old today compared to a 15 to 19 year old 20 years ago? That's what she did. It's very interesting, very interesting. Here's some excerpts of what she found. Name is Jean Twidge, head of the psychology department at uh, San Diego State University. I, again, I don't think she's a Christian, but how much is too much? At what point is this screen time having an impact? Three hours of screen time a day increases the chance that a teen will be at risk for committing suicide. Three hours a day. And what's the average right now? Guys, she continues. This isn't Carl Kirby, the fundamentalist. This is her. Rates of teen depression and suicide have skyrocketed since 2011. Guess what blew up in 2011? It's not an exaggeration to describe iGen as being on the brink of the worst mental health crisis. In decades, much of this deterioration can be traced to their phones. There's compelling evidence that the devices we place in young people's hands are having profound effects on their lives and making them seriously unhappy. One of the ironies of iGen life is that despite spending far more time under the same roof as their parents, today's teens can hardly be said to be closer to their mothers and fathers than their predecessors were. Quote, I've seen my friends with their families they don't talk to them, unquote, Athena told me. Quote, they just say, okay, okay, whatever, while they're on their phones. They don't pay attention to their family, unquote. Like her peers, Athena is an expert at tuning out her parents so, her, so she can focus on her phone. Have you ever experienced that? You ever walked into a restaurant, a family of four sitting at a table, all four of them with their face stuck in a device and not a one of them talking to each other? You ever seen it? Ever had it happen to you? This is a voice, and it's having an impact on a generation. Well, Carl, you're up here telling us to sign up for your free videos and telling us to get your app. You're using it, you hypocrite. No, 
I know the power of it. And guess what? You send me a message, guess who sees it? Because my system is set up that my wife sees whatever comes in. Because I know I'm an idiot. So I'm going to protect myself. I'm going to be held accountable. We have to do this. And if you think me, almost 60-year-old man can't control this stuff, what do you think a 15, 16-year-old child's going to do with this? Teens who, are, uh, who spend more time than average on screen activities are more likely to be unhappy, and those who spend more time than average on non-screen activities are more likely to be happy. There's not a single exception. If you were going to give advice for a happy adolescence based on this survey, it would be straightforward. Put down the phone, turn off the laptop, and do something, anything that does not involve a screen. If you have a child that's suffering from anxiety and depression, one of the first places may I encourage you to check is how much screen time do they have and start cutting it back. So you're against medication. No, I'm not. Look, it's a biological fact. Sin has destroyed the world that we live in, and there are folks that have chemical imbalances, and there's medication that's necessary, but I don't think it's the vast majority of the cases that we have going on in our culture. It's actions. It's consequences of bad decisions. I'm going to be blunt with you. If I had a teenager today, i got five grandchildren, I told you all that. I don't have any teens in my house. If I had a teenager in my house, they wouldn't have one of these phones. They would have a phone that was so dumb, you couldn't even text on it. I'm serious, because you need to learn how to spell. An R has an A and an E somewhere in there, and U has a Y-O. Now, you got to go figure out where they fit, but I want you to learn how to spell. And when you come in this house, that dumb phone is going in there, and it's not going in your bedroom. There's not a parent, a grandparent in this room right now that would allow their child, their grandchild, into their bedroom with the door locked with a stranger and spend the night. Is there? You do it every time they go in with one of these because you have no clue who they're with. Told you, younger generation's not going to like me. So what can you do? They got one? All right. Here's some ideas. Covenant Eyes, they've got a great program where you plug them in. You see what they see. You know what's going on. You can control how much time is spent where. You've got a tool to help you on that. Uh, Circle, Disney makes this. and Disney can make something good? Yeah. This is actually a pretty decent uh, program. Take a look at it. And if you're a guy like me that travels all the time, they have Circle Go, which was designed for people that travel. But I can get on my phone, and every device in my house runs through it. Now, oh, they can backdoor it. Well, guess what? If they backdoor it, it shuts the whole system down. That's the one negative to it. You can tell when the kids are trying to backdoor the system because it shuts everything down. But you can at least see how much time they're spending where. Oh, by the way, uh, you can assign when they can get on the Internet. Oh, you want your, your Internet time for the week? Yes, okay, we can do that from uh, 6.30, 6.35 in the morning. And that's it. It doesn't work the rest of the time. And by the way, it doesn't work until you don't get on it until you've done your chores. Chores? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Guys, it's a tool. We can't afford it. Well, then look at something like custom. Dodio, I don't even know how to say it, but it's something that I ran across in my research that it's a free parent, uh, parental control app that might be a tool to help you with. Here's another one. You really, you got a serious problem? Then maybe you look at something like this. It's like a two-way, basically a two-way radio where you can talk to your child and that's it. That's, it's just you and them. Oh, that's clunky. That's weird. They're not going to like that. Then you get them this thing. You, you need to watch this commercial. I'm not going to show this commercial too. It's like one of the best commercials ever. And it looks like a smartphone, but all it is is a regular old phone. So they pull out their smartphone, and all it is is a regular old phone that they can't message or any of that stuff on it, and it just comes to you. And it's, I think it's one of the, it's called Gab, G-A-B-B, wireless. If you're really looking for something, take a look at it, because, and their commercial, their commercial is worth digging and looking up, okay? So you can do something, but the one thing you can't do is nothing. You have to get engaged and involved because it's a voice that's having an impact. How about this, TV? How many hours are the kids spending in uh, school again? Anybody remember the number I threw it at you this morning? How many hours a year? 900 hours a year in school. Uh, uh, so television, television. Oh, you can do the math on the uh, internet. Television, 
What's the average time that uh, people are spending watching television? Average American watches five hours of TV per day, and I think that is way up since COVID, to be very honest with you. These are old numbers, because <laughs> COVID changed everything. Five hours of live TV per day. Huh. If you do that, the math there works out to 1,064 hours a year. 1,064 hours a year watching television. And by the way, what are we watching when we're watching TV? Well, the top show on demand in 2019, I'll update it when, you know, at the end, when 2020 is done. The top show on demand in 2019 was a show called Game of Thrones. In full disclosure, I have never seen an episode of Game of Thrones. I have not. I'm just being honest with you. But what I found interesting is that the show, the series ended in 2019, and there were a couple things that just really jumped out at me. There were a couple of scandals in this program, right? Uh, here's the scandal. Did you miss the coffee cup? There was a coffee, a Starbucks coffee cup in the scene. We're talking about Viking era, and these people are back there drinking scar, uh, you know, Starbucks. It was a scandal. News, primetime news. People wound up. I was like, what? They spent millions of dollars to go in and vi uh, edit out the coffee cup. Because when it was in the scene, they had the coffee cup, so people were freaking out so bad, they spent millions of dollars to go in and edit out the coffee cup. But it got worse. Plastic bottles, plastic water bottles. Just a few episodes later, they're sitting there, and they had plastic water bottles by their feet. Oh, scandal. Scandal. You know what bothered me about all of this? I've not seen an episode, and a part of the reason I've never seen an episode is I went and I did the research on the show. I don't know what it's about, and when I read this, I said, there's no way I'm going to watch it. This is a secular reviewer talking about the program, okay? This isn't some Christian telling you to throw your TV out and go be a hermit and live up in the mountains and get off the grid, okay? Secular reviewer. Rape has become so pervasive in the drama that it is almost background noise, a routine, and unshocking occurrence. Now, follow me on this for a second, please. We're going to have front page news. We're going to be prime time news. There's a coffee cup. There's a plastic bottle left in the filming of this show. Ooh, scandal. And out of the other corner of your mouth, you're watching a program that makes abuse of women commonplace and there's no uproar what am I missing why would I fill myself with that I mean honestly guys be careful what you let in when you look at the top watch television programs what voice are we letting speak to us I'm not challenging you to well, I am challenging you. I'm challenging you to look at what you're letting in. When I walk into hotel rooms, I spend a lot of, well, I did last year, not so much this year, but when I go into a hotel room, guess what never comes on? I never turn the TV on. I will not turn the TV on, period. And not because I have a problem with it, but because I'm not going to even entertain the opportunity to have a problem with it. Matthew 6, 22 and 3 says the eye is a lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. What you let in is going to work its way out. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. If you're spending 11 hours a day here, five hours a day here, that's the company that you keep. And you better believe it's having an impact. In Psalm 101.3, you know this, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. And any show that makes abuse towards women commonplace is wicked. Why would I indulge myself in that? Oh, good storyline. Action. What? Now I really get the kids mad at me. 900 hours a year in a school system, 1,064 in front of a TV set. What about video games? Yeah. 
You know the average time a young person spends playing video games? Well, let's just go through the numbers and see what we find. The average young person racks up 10,000 hours of gaming by the age of 21, or 24 hours less than they spend in a classroom for all of middle and high school if they have perfect attendance. Nine hundred and thirty-six hours a year is the average time for gaming. My son, I didn't look. I'm a gamer because I can play uh, Dr. Mario, flip, flip, drop. So I'm a gamer, right? By the way, a lot of you mature people are gamers now too. A lot of candy crushing going on in this older generation. So we want to, we want to, those kids, oh, those kids are gaming. Uh, how many of y'all are playing games? Look, it's a broader thing now than just kids. It's expended. My son came to me a number of years ago, and he said, uh, Dad, you think television and movies is having the impact on my generation? Oh, no, it's the video game. You go watch a television show, a, a movie, hour and a half movie, well, guess what? You spend 25, 50, 100 hours playing a video game that has the exact same messaging in it, but worse, because they don't restrict the video game as much as they restrict the movies and the TV. The things they can't show in the TV and the movies, they do in the game. And by the way, you're naming the character after yourself most of the time, and you're choosing to do what you are doing to whatever you're doing it to. It's given. If you're playing certain games, it's a given. But how about spiritual message? How is God, Jesus, Bible, Christians, how are they depicted in some of the top-selling video games? And by the way, I'm not trying to be a salesperson, but you can only cover so much in talks. That stuff that my son brought to me, his talk is out there. It's uh, one of the DVDs that I have. Again, it's all donation. There's a box out there. Nobody's going to twist your arm to sell or anything like that. There's suggested prices out there if you want to get it, but it's called Game Over. It's not just a game. And that's him going through the spiritual messages. I'm going to give you a couple of them, but he goes through a whole bunch more. Because what he found is that a lot of the games, the first two or three hours are pretty safe. And then they start throwing in this other stuff. And he's like, he said, you know, I think I know why they do it, Dad, because even the parents that are, like, involved with their children, they might sit down for two or three hours to watch what's going on. But then, dude, I'm out of here. You know, this is 25, 50, 100 hours. I don't have that kind of time, right? But they'll spend a couple hours to just check and make sure. The gaming company knows this. So that's out there. And again, uh, and if you want to do a check for us, I know people ask me, just the ministry name, Reasons for Hope, but make it easy. Use the initials, R-F-O-R-H, and just throw it in the box. Assassin's Creed, have you ever heard of it? No spiritual messages in there. One of the top-selling video games. Really, no, no spiritual messages in there? How about this side episode that you get to play where you as the assassin get to go in and save Jesus, pull him off the cross. Jesus didn't die on a cross. And by the way, exact scriptures, the, the words that were spoken in the scripture, the, 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 with the, the, the wine, and the, the, I mean, and no, you, you, Jesus didn't die on a cross. And by the way, when you read the write-ups on uh, Assassin's Creed, you had people recommending, we need to have our children play this game because it teaches them history. It gives them appreciation for history. Yeah, totally distorted history. Look, our children are being taught junk, man. How about this, another side issue. Charles Darwin, poor old Charles Darwin, those mean old Christians, those mean old Christians are chasing him all over town, so you have to protect poor Charlie D because they're trying to kill him because his message is going to destroy the moral fabric of our society. So what are the Christians doing? They're trying to kill him. And those Christians, you know what else they're doing? They're killing the newsboys. And I'm not talking about the band. I'm talking about the little children that are selling the newspapers. They're killing them. Those Christians are killing the newsboy. What? <laughs> How about this for a second, though? Follow me on this. If the only Christian that you've ever seen is from Family Guy, Simpsons, Desperate Housewives, Law and Order, Assassin's Creed, what is your perception of Christians and Christianity going to be? See, by our silence, this becomes the norm. This becomes the stereotype. And by the way, 
we're not going to go do the Grand Theft Auto thing. Yes, there's messages in there. And if you don't think it's having an impact, 80 million copies sold, over $3 billion generated. It's a voice. It's having an impact. And there are spiritual messages. And by the way, my daughter just brought this one to me not too long ago. Anybody know what this is? I showed this two and a half weeks ago when I was in a Christian school, and as soon as I put this in, oh, the kid, oh, yeah, 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 one little girl. I said, oh, would you please come down here and explain to everybody what this is all about? And she was in joy heaven, man. Just, oh, this, 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 boom, bing, bing, bang, boom, telling everything. My daughter brings this to me. She's like, we had to ban this. The kids can't wear this to school anymore. I said, what? It's just, it's just stuffed dolls. Uh, no. This is a game that parents have bought for their kids and don't have a clue what it is because it's just cute, plush toys. No, it's not. Let me read to you what this is all about. It's called Five Nights at Freddy's. The main antagonist of the series is William Afton, the co-founder, owner of Fazbear Entertainment, as well as the CEO of Afton Robotics, LLC, the company behind Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. He is a serial killer who murdered several children. His spirits now, and the, the, the children's spirits now inhabit the animatronics. In the game, in third game, it's revealed that he returned to Freddy Fazbear's Pizza after it closed down to dismantle the animatronics. This supposedly released the spirits of the children he murdered scaring him into hiding inside of a suit where he was crushed to death. Yeah, this is a children's uh, plush toy thing, right? Because this is dirty, nasty stuff. Why would you talk about this in church? Because we don't have a clue, and it's being out there and given to children, and we need to be aware of it. By the way, Video game addiction is now officially a mental health disorder. I don't put a whole lot of stock in the WHO after this last debacle, but this is what they have to say. It's, a gaming, it's, a, it's called gaming disorder. It is a mental health problem. My son came to me about five years ago, and he said, Dad, I'm getting rid of cable TV. What? I have cable TV. I watch The Voice. He said, I'm getting rid of it. Why? He said, I got a problem. He said, Dad, I did this. Now, I'm going to give this to you. Parent, grandparent, if you're going to do this to your child or grandchild, you need to do it because I did it, and it's part of the reason why I don't turn TV on when I go into, uh, to the hotels anymore. He said, Dad, I took a piece of paper. I drew a line down the middle, line at the top. On the one side, I put time spent glorifying God. On the other side, I put time spent in the world. And he said, for one week, I tracked how much time I prayed, how much time I read the Word, how much time I did fellowship. I tracked it. And he said, man, I was so happy. I prayed for an hour one week. I read the Scripture for an hour and a half. And then I looked at the other side. And he said, Dad, I got a problem. So TV is gone. My son was 33 years old at the time. Did I have to go to my 33-year-old son and tell him that he needed to get rid of this? Come on, man. If you haven't done that when they're here, it's going to be pretty tough to do it when it's up here. When they own it, and that's what Christianity is, you as an individual owning it, a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, then you're willing to do this stuff and not somebody having to tell you to do it. He said, I got a problem, so TV is gone. I did it. Guess what? When I go on the road, I don't turn TV on. Because I started looking at it, I was like, gosh, I could spend that much time studying the Word, building presentations, studying this to try to go out and... It's gone. How about this? How about this? Um, here's a good voice. Here's a good voice. Um, the news. We got a few mature folk in here. Remember, dear uh, Abby... <clears throat> Remember Dear Abby? Well, in England, they got a Dear Abby, but she's not called Dear Abby. She's called Agony Aunt, and I can't do the British accent very well. I'm a country boy. But she is the British version of Dear Abby. For you younger generation, you don't have a clue. Dear Abby was someone that you wrote into with your concerns and your questions, and she would. it was a newspaper column, and she would write back. Yeah, there, people read newspapers back then, and they were really paper, you know. <laughs> 
not on the screen. Uh, but then she would respond back and address the, uh, the issue that you wrote in. So uh, Agony Aunt was on TV in England. I, I, I go over there and uh, love doing ministry in England. But she's on, it, man, you got to, she's on TV and the question is asked of her. Is, uh, I'm sorry, can a mother love their child so much? Can a mother love their so, child so much that they choose to abort them? Okay? Can a mother love their child so much that they would do that? Her response is very interesting. True, no, and I think that um, if I were a mother of a, a suffering child, I would be the first to want, I mean, a deeply suffering child, I would be the first to want to put a pillow well, over its face. Oh, uh, excuse me. The first thought that comes to my mind is that if my child is suffering, uh, please pass the pillow. Do you understand that what you believe about where you come from is going to impact the way that you live your life. And if there is no God, and you are not created in his image, and your value and your worth is based on what you have to offer to society, what happens when you don't have very much? And you compare yourself to billboards, young ladies, and you say, I can't measure up to that. You compare yourself to a magazine. You can't measure up to that. You bet you can't because it doesn't exist. It's called Photoshop. But we have a generation that's been raised that their value is based on how well they compare to something that doesn't even exist. But if there is a God that created the way that he said that he did, you know where your value comes from? You are created in his image. You are fearfully, wonderfully made. You are literally knit together in your mother's womb. And Christ died for you while you were rejecting him. You want value. Nothing can give you more value than that right there. The creator of the universe died for you as an individual because he wanted to be with you in a personal relationship. That's value. Looks, talent, money, nothing. What? Past the pillar? It gets better. Um, as I from... would with a, you know, any suffering thing. And I think the difference is that my uh, uh, feeling of, of horror, suffering, is much greater than my feeling of uh, getting rid of a couple of cells. If there is no God, you are nothing more than a couple of cells. And she is absolutely consistent with her worldview. Why should we be shocked to see what we see in the culture today? Where I can beat you, stomp on your head, because you don't agree with me. And I am stronger than you, so therefore, you got what I want, I take it. Guys, that's a worldview. That's a philosophy. That's a world without God. I hope there's no good mothers in here by her definition. Take a listen. I, I'm sorry, I was just about to introduce another guest there, but that was a, that's a pretty horrifying thing what? to say, that you would put a pillow over there. Of course I would, if it was child. a child I really loved who was in agony. I, I think any good mother would. I was blessed to be able to take a group over to Israel, and when you go through the Holocaust Museum, your heart has got to be yanked out of your chest, or it's not beating. And there was a sign that I read that really struck me. It says, a country is not just what it does, it is also what it puts up with, what it tolerates. And may I say to you this evening that we, body of Christ, have tolerated far too long our country teaching a generation that their value is based on anything other than the fact that they are created in God's image and lying to them. We've tolerated it for too long. How about this? Here's a great voice. The family. Hey, there's a great voice. The family, right? You don't think Satan's involved in that one? The American Family and Re uh, Crisis Research by the Southern Baptist Council on Family Life uncovers some disturbing facts. How many hours in the uh, school system? 900. How many hours watching uh, television? 1,064. How many playing video games? 936. Or, uh, yeah, 936 video games. The average time... A child spends with a parent in meaningful conversation? The majority of children in America have fewer than 10 minutes of significant and meaningful conversation with their parents each week. 
and you think in less than 10 minutes you're going to overcome all that mess that this world is throwing at them, and if I can get really personal, see, there's two dynamics to what I try to do in ministry. Number one, I go after younger generation. I really do. But number two, men. Ladies, I mean no disrespect to you, but I think we need biblical, godly men. Men who are willing to live a life that God called them to live, to carry out the responsibilities that they are called to fulfill. And a part of the reason we see the breakdown that we see in the church today is because many men are not accepting that responsibility and they're pawning it off on somebody else. Because I'm going to finish the quote for you. If you remove the mother, you can measure this statistic in seconds. I can't talk to them. They're going to get mad. I can't do this. I can't do that. They're going to get mad. Guys, I'd rather my child be mad at me than dead or destroyed. So what do I do? Come on, Carl, another heavy message, man. Well, the first thing that we have to do is we have to wake up and realize that there's a problem. There's a problem. We can't run and hide from it. Not addressing it is not the answer. In America, the most Christian nation on the planet, every 45 minutes, 60 children will attempt suicide, 80 will run away, 21 teenagers uh, will have an abortion, and over 1,000 teens will take some form of drug. And this is America, the most Christian nation on the planet. So what do we do? I think we listen to the correct voice. And I know that you know where I'm going with this. And that voice is the Word of God. It is the one that has the answers But we live in a time that they have been duped into thinking that you can't trust that book. It's outdated. It's full of mistakes and errors. Anybody ever heard that claim? Can't trust the Bible. It's full of mistakes and errors. Anybody ever heard that one? Anybody? Anybody? Well, we debunk that claim, and I'm going to play that for you now because, you see, we're getting ready to wrap up, and i got to wake you up so that you can go out and drive home because I don't want you to sleep driving. So put your seatbelt on and let me pick up the pace just a little bit as we get ready to close this out. People love to say the Bible is full of errors and contradictions, but the truth is most of them can be pretty easily resolved with a little common sense, honest investigation of the scripture and the application of a simple method we're about to talk about. So let's do this. Let's tackle the alleged errors issue. We'll do that by using a method I like to call a simple C. S. Spelling. That's right. Many of the so-called errors in the manuscript are simple variants in letters. Say you have one manuscript that was translated from Greek into Old English and another into American English. Well, the English translators might write down theater with the R-E ending, and the American team might write down theater with the E-R ending. Now, that's no error, my fellow thespians. It's a variant in spelling, so that's that for that one. On to the M. M is for mistranslation. This is when the original word might not have been translated to the new language perfectly or something along those lines. you got to realize that sometimes there's not a perfect word equivalent at the time of translation or that the translator simply had a slip of the pen or used a word that perhaps could be translated in different ways. Context and comparison solves this lickety split. For instance, Leviticus 11, 13 through 19 says, and these you should regard as an abomination among birds. The eagle, the vulture, buzzard, and bat. Folks go nuts on this one. Bats aren't birds. Bats aren't birds. The Bible is wrong and can't be trusted. Come on. First of all, they didn't have the same animal classifications back then, and the original Hebrew word translated bird here is alf, or however you pronounce that. And although correctly translated bird in many places, it also has a broad meaning like having wings or winged creature, which would, of course, include bats. This is all settled pretty easily with a little looking and thinking, I'd say. Moving on to P for perspective. Sometimes the testimony of two people can seem contradictory, but when you pay close attention, it might not be that way at all. Quick example. Say there was a car parked in the middle of the street. There's a person on the right of the car and a person on the left. The person on the right says the car door is blue and there's a baby in the back, and the person on the other side says the car door is white and there are two babies. Now, how can this be? These ferocious liars can't be trusted. Now, wait a second there, Jimmy Conclusion Jumper. Fact is, the car could be painted white on one side and blue on the other, and if there are two babies in there is one, right? So both are actually illuminating the fullness of the scene. Remember, the guy on the right didn't say there was only one baby, he just mentioned one. You gotta pay attention to the language and perspective, people. Sometimes the whole truth is in the details, you follow? L. Literal versus figurative. It's pretty clear that the Bible contains different writing styles like poetry and narrative and uses different parts of speech like similes, metaphors, and analogies, pretty much like we still do today. So if we really want to interpret correctly, it's our job to realize and understand the difference. How, you ask? Great question. By looking at the immediate context using our noggin and comparing it with the rest of Scripture. That way we understand when Jesus says in John 10, 7 that he is the door, he doesn't mean he's a wooden rectangle that swings on hinges. Need I say more? Finally, C for context. This is the biggie, folks. I'd say most alleged error issues arise when people don't acknowledge the proper context 
context of the verse, they quote only part of it or purposefully misuse it. They might say John 3.16 says, For God so loved. But they say Deuteronomy 16.22 says, The Lord your God hates. Now which is it? Does he love or does he hate? Well, you know, this is silly. Because the context of John 3.16 is about God's love for people, and the Deut verse is talking about his hate for pillars. You know, if you hack, twist, and misquote everything, you can pretty much make it say whatever you want, and that's not really searching for truth. So, there you have it. With a little effort, honest investigation, and application of the simple C method, the idea that the authority or inerrancy of the Bible is in any way diminished due to errors has been debunked. Adios. And remember, if you want to get those and the new ones before we release them, all you have to do is, is I change this three-letter thing to a four-letter thing so that it wouldn't autocorrect. So, adios, FBCE, to 51555. And then you'll get the current ones that we have, a link to those, but then also the new ones, you'll get them before we release them to the general public. See, to me, the greatest gift that we can offer to this younger generation is a gift of confidence and being able to trust the Word of God as an authority and as a standard. The only way I know how to do that is when I look at Scripture and I read it, I, I see what Jesus did. And let me just share with you in Luke 24. And behold, I'm just going to do the CKV, the Carl Kirby version on this. Uh, the two people walk into the road, you know the road to Emmaus, they're walking and Jesus comes up to them and he starts talking to them and they're, they're, they're not understanding what's going on and Jesus comes up and says, what are you all talking about? And they're like, what, are you new or something? The Chicago attitude thing. Don't you understand? He was the guy, he's not the guy. They didn't understand. Jesus is talking to them and they don't understand why he did what he said that he did. So what did Jesus have to do? Please take this example. As a Christian, that means I'm a Christ follower. I'm, suppo I'm supposed to follow his example. What did he do? These people didn't understand it. They were lost or wondering. What did Jesus do? And he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And then he says this, and I think this is profound. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Look, it's crazy. I'm not going to lie to you. It's crazy. The things we see going on in the culture is like, how in the world can this be going on? I don't get it, God. How about we do what Jesus did? We go back to the beginning. We understand why we see what we see. It's not God's fault. We want to blame God for all this craziness that we see. It's not his fault. God gave us what he wanted. What did he give us? At the end of creation, everything was? Hello? It was very good, not just good, it was very good, perfect, no death, no tear, no sorrow. That's what God wanted for us, but he also wanted a perfect relationship with you and I. And if I force you into a relationship with me, that's not perfect. So I have to give you the opportunity to receive or reject, and guess what? We are living in the time of us saying, no thank you, God, we wanna do what we wanna do, this is what you get, but, he loves us so much that he's going to come back and he's going to make it right. And next time, we're there because we trusted him and it's done. But Carl, you don't understand. Come on, man. We are right on the outskirts of Cleveland. The churches here are failing. We're such a small group here. We can't reach this big community. Jesus Christ turned the world upside down with 12. What are you talking about? If Jesus can turn the world upside down with 12, there's more than 12 here this evening. He can turn your community around three or four times. But he's got to be the one doing the work. We just have to be obedient. And it depends on whose voice you're going to listen to. One thing I'll make you aware of, parents, um, I brought... I only brought 10 of these things. It's called Fast Facts. It's a booklet that's out there that I, I, it was meant to be a, a one-month devotional for parents to watch. A, there's a video that goes, a DVD that goes with it. Minute and a half video. You watch the video, and then there's questions based on the video so that now you engage in conversation. So to me, I wanted to do it over dinner time. It's what I do with my grandchildren. We talk about these things. I don't use the video, though, because... I'm there, you know, so I don't need the video. But I, we talk about the information, and then we uh, go through these questions, just have a 10-minute conversation with the children just to get them thinking, and that's what it is. And by the way, when you get done with this one and you do more of this on your own, you are going to be able to start leading a tour through your local zoo. You got a zoo here in Cleveland? 
Guess what? You've got a great ministry. Start leading a tour through your zoo from a biblical perspective. Use their signage to teach what the world teaches, but then use the Word of God to say, this is what God says, this is what they say, this is what we actually see. Because when you start talking about the design features on just the four animals that are in this book, you just use that stuff alone, it's amazing. So uh, God, <laughs> he screams, but it's got the questions in there, it's got the answers in there, and it's got a coloring sheet in there as well. And by the way, those videos, those exact videos, are also on the app. So you don't even have to buy this. Those videos are on the app. Because again, we're trying to put tools in folks' hands to have those conversations, all right? And it's on YouTube as well if you do our YouTube thing. Remember Craig Wayne Boyd? Sang the old rugged cross, final eight. He got voted through to the final four, by the way. He ended up winning the whole season that year. But something interesting happened because now those of you that aren't familiar with the show, they've got them on their team. They sing. When they get done singing, then the four coaches give them feedback, advice, whatever, right? Well, after he sang the old rugged cross, one of the judges was a man named Pharrell Williams. I'm not attacking him. But he's not a Christian by his own admission. He was raised in the church, but he rejected it all. He's a universalist. Pharrell Williams was the first person to talk to Craig Wayne Boyd after he sang the old rugged cross. And take a listen to what he says. Uh, let's start with Pharrell. What'd you think? Man, Craig, I get it, man. To God be the glory. I just. <laughs> Amen. Going through, going through everything that you've gone through to get, your, get yourself here at this place, I have a question for you. What does it feel like to be at the top of your game and to surrender it to God in front of the whole entire world and sing? Remember, this is a secular program. Now, I'm, I'm telling you right up front, he didn't do anything to get himself there. It's a gift from God. I understand that. But let me ask you this. Is that not an opportunity, a silver platter, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ on national television? Is it not? Hello? Would you like to hear how Craig Wayne Boyd responded? I'm not going to show you. I'm not. You know why I'm not? Because I want to make a point. It doesn't matter how he responded. Here's what really matters. Am I, Carl Kirby, not attacking you, am I, Carl Kirby, living my life in such a way that the lost would even think to ask me that question? Or have I gotten so good at blending in with the culture that I go through life Monday through Saturday, whew, made it through another week, nobody knows I'm a Christian. Yes. Are we living our lives in such a way that people would even think to ask us that question? Now, I do want to show you somebody who did ask, answer a question. His name is Benjamin Watson. He's a football player. And he was on CNN. Remember when Fergus, Ferguson was going on, all the protesting, all the rioting, and all that going on? And he was asked a very important question. What do we do with all this racism? How do we address it? He's on CNN. Please watch this. How can we, you know, black, white, whatever, improve this? Well, I, I, honestly, I think I, I point to it in the very last paragraph that I read. And, and I'm encouraged because things aren't the way they used to be. You know, we all have grandparents that, that told us how things were. We've all seen documentaries. We are definitely making progress. But I think on an individual, on a, uh, on a micro level, the issue is not really skin. The issue is sin. And I, I firmly believe that the issue is that internally we are flawed. Internally, we need salvation from our sin. Internally, our sin makes us prideful. It makes us judgmental. It makes us prejudiced, which leads to racism. It makes us lash out at people that don't look like us. It makes us look past, look past evidence to protect people that look like us. It, it makes us do all those things. It makes us lash out in anger. It makes us point finger. It, 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 it wow. makes us, our sin that's in us makes us do those things. And the only, the only salvation for this sin is the gospel. The only way to really cure that was on the inside is understanding that Jesus Christ died for our sins. And so, the, to me, on a micro level, it's understanding. It. Oh, and just like that, we lost him. I know, I heard you guys rapping me. I just couldn't let him go. Benjamin Watson, thank you so much. Good luck at the game Sunday. I'm Brooke Baldwin. See you Monday. Jim Shudo, up next. 
man, I hate it when that happens. Just, just like that, I lost him. Look, guys, federal employee, 24 and a half years, air traffic controller, O'Hare, last eight and a half years of my career, I was threatened to be fired multiple times for proselytizing. My boss, I told him one day, I said, you can come in here and you can talk about whatever, whoever you're doing, whatever with, but if I talk about what Jesus is doing in my life, you can fire me? Yes. I said, well, let me put it to you like this. If God wants me here, there's not a thing you can do to get me out. If he doesn't want me here, there's not a thing I can do to stay, so do what you got to do because I got to do what I got to do. See ya. Guys, I'm not holding me up as some kind of guy because trust me, I got plenty of rough edges. But there comes a time when we, body of Christ, have just got to stand and be firm and be bold for the Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to cut you off. They're going to mock you. They're going to call you names. They're going to say things about you in the newspaper that aren't true. You hear me? But he knows what's true. And so what do we do? We be obedient. We speak the truth in love. We do what he called us to do. And we watch what he will do. Because he's going to do amazing things through simple obedience. Guys, I just look at Scripture, and I'll finish with this. When I read in Matthew that you, 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 you are the light of the world, he means it. But we need to be shining. And if we are not shining, then what good are we? I'm going to finish with this one, Matthew 16. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Do you understand the implications of that question right there? Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Do you know what that means? We have got to be engaged with the culture. Or we can't answer that question. We're not called to isolate ourselves away from the world. We're called to engage the world. I don't agree with what's going on, but you better believe that I can understand it and I can challenge them on it and make them think. I don't convict or convert. I converse. But unless you're engaged, you can't answer that question. And then it finishes with this, and so I'll finish with this. But who do you say that I am? And the way that each and every one of us answers that question individually determines where we spend eternity. So the microphone's in your hand. And if you're sitting here tonight and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, then the one thing that I have to say to you is that there is a place that God has prepared for those who say, no, thank you, God, I don't want to be a part. It's called hell. It's not politically correct. We don't like to talk about it, but it's real. It's eternal separation from a heavenly Father that loves you so much that he died for you, and he does not want any one of us to go there, so much so that he died for us. So I would ask you to please consider what he claims. Don't trust me. Don't believe me. Go dig for yourself. What he says in his word, is it absolutely consistent with what we see in the world or not? That's what I'm going to try to show the rest of the week that I'm with you guys, especially to uh, these younger generations that I'll be with the next three days. I ask you for the prayers with those young folks. Thank you for supporting this school. Thank you for being a part of this school. This next generation is worth the the input that you're going to give them and the support.